This video is sponsored by Brooklinen. What comes to your mind when I say the words, Messy Tales, the brown nose pup? If you've never heard the name before, you probably think it's some kind of children's television show, maybe. Full of happy woodland creatures, and at the end of every episode, there's a moral lesson for the kids. As I say this, I'm picturing, like, Franklin or Blinky Bill. But those of you who know the name, you know this ain't no Blinky Bill. This ain't no Babar, this ain't no Tailspin. And if it was Messy Tailspin, Baloo would have turds just smeared all over his fur, caked in there, causing him to lose control and crash the plane. <laughs> That's right, this is the story of the furry who ate so much poop that he might have died. Whose current whereabouts are a tangled web of lies and misinformation. For this episode of Tales from the Internet, we take a look at Messy Tales, the brown nose pup. Messy Tales, the brown nose pup is probably one of the most infamous figures lurking beneath the surface of Twitter's seedy, furry underbelly. As he puts it, he's a big, fat, messy g Shep, NSFW, and that squiggly line, if you don't know what that squiggly line is, that means he's into fucking an actual animals. But he doesn't really talk about that, he just mostly talks about being fat and shitting himself. <laughs> oh, and of course, eating the shit. They eat the poo poo! So whenever I bring up messy tales, as one does, I usually hear one of two things. Either, oh, didn't that guy die? Or, hey, didn't that guy get institutionalized? We'll get into why people think these things later, but I'm not convinced either way. But in any case, let's start from the beginning. July 29th, 2013. That's when he made his first tweets. Today, for me, is Mud Butt Monday. I forgot to wipe. <laughs> forgot. I mean... <sighs> oh, you. You're too much. Now, this account, when somebody gets sent this, usually the big thing is, uh, you know, click the media section at your own risk. But it's actually several years before he even posts a single image. At first, it's mostly just him talking about the stuff that he liked to do. Like the time he fantasized about stealing some dog shit, sneaking it home with him, and then shoving it up his own ass. Pawing while thinking of finding fresh dog shit. Sneaking it home in my pants, pushing it in me, licking my muddy paws while pushing it out. You know, it's like butt chugging a beer gets in your system faster. Or how about the time? He wanted to have himself a peanut butter and poop sandwich. I want to be force-fed meals made with my own mess. Peanut butter and poop sandwiches. Chocolate poop milkshakes. Poop donuts. A lot of this early phase of the account is mostly just relegated to fantasy. I mean, sure, he does talk a lot about doing things like shitting himself, and then going to sleep without cleaning his shitty ass, and then waking up with an itchy ass because he slept in his own shit, sure. But a lot of what he talks about is mostly just relegated to ideas and not necessarily actions. Looking at the early days of the account, I very much get the impression that this is a guy who gradually falls further and further into the world of this fetish until he finally becomes an absolute danger to himself. And part of why at first he can't really go all the way like he would want to is his living situation. He often talks about how rarely he has time alone in his home, and he savors the rare times he does have the place all to himself. I may have a chance to be messy tomorrow evening, but I want to try a diaper for the first time. But I don't know where to get one. Any store? I mean, yeah, pretty much, dude. Have you ever, have you ever been to, like, any store? I'm pretty sure you get a diaper at, like, 7 out of 10 stores that exist in the world. But he did like his shopping tips. Is there such a thing as a catheter for the butt? <laughs> Something that forces it open all the time? I want to explore loss of control. To which someone suggested he could just go buy an open butt plug. And then there's the cooking tips. Does oatmeal mix with poop easy? I'm wondering. Helps create that nice, almost dropping consistency. But these are all just side quests. The main quest line of the Messy Tales Brown Nose Pup RPG, he needs to acquire three things. A car, a new place where he can live alone, and a fursuit. Oh, how he wanted his very own fursuit. I'm saving up for a fursuit. White German Shepherd. It won't stay white for long. You see, for all the talk about getting shit stuck in his fur, he didn't actually have a fursuit yet. Maybe at that point it was pure fantasy, maybe he was referring to his body hair as his fur, which I guess is a possibility. It's all up in the air, we're still many years into the pre-photography Messy Tales era. His car quest, he completes very early though. 
buying one in November of 2013 and having himself a nice, messy camping trip. Can you imagine walking through the woods and then you just happen to stumble upon this guy, rolling around in his own shit? Although he is careful to make sure not to get his car smelling like shit. I can respect that. You work hard, you save up for something, you buy it, and then you take good care of it by avoiding getting shit all over it. But the living situation was a bit more difficult. He would often tweet about how badly he needed to get his own place. Because presumably he was hiding all this from whoever it was he was living with, whether it be roommates or family or whatever. And in April of 2014, he said that he was close to saving enough money to move out. But then a month later, disaster strikes. His department at work gets outsourced. Although he doesn't get laid off, the future is uncertain. And after this final lament in 2015, he disappears for close to a year. Nobody quite knows how he spent that year. Perhaps he took the opportunity to focus on his job and raise money for his new place. Perhaps he simply wasn't as motivated to post anymore. But a year is a lot of time to reflect on the kind of life you've been living. Then, on July 14th of 2016, I've not used this much. I think it's time to change that. <laughs> it's unclear whether or not he actually got his own place during that absence, but one thing for sure, he did become emboldened. Warning, couple messy photos coming soon. You may want to mute or unfollow me if that isn't okay. Now, I reviewed YouTube's Terms of Service in preparation for this video, and I'm still not entirely sure whether or not I can actually show you these photos. So what I'm gonna do is, I'm going to give you my best artist depiction of them. So you remember how Messy Tales he had a third quest item aside from his car and his apartment. Fursuit. That shit's expensive, so he went and made his own paws. They kinda look like this, Muppet Elmo hands, but white. And holding a turd. And then he squeezes the turd, and boom, now the white hands are brown. He's got his giant dog dick dildo lined up next to a full... <laughs> next to a full sausage shit. For a size comparison, mashes the dildo up in the shit, and then he has a plastic baggie filled with a mix of shit and bad dragon cum lube. He then proceeds to quote-unquote muzzlefuck himself with the shitty dog dick, and licks it clean. It was a good meal. But he can never get it perfectly clean, and he's fine with that. What he's not fine with? That shit baggy. That's just not enough shit for messy tails. Gotta upgrade to at least the gallon bag, but, you know, one dog cannot produce a gallon's worth of shit. I don't know why I just called him a dog when he's not really a dog. It's like I've been gaslit by the brown nose pup now. So he thinks back to a thought he had all the way back in 2014. That's right. The poop oatmeal. He makes the shit oatmeal, and you can't help it. I just want to dive in, man. He has himself a little feast, and also shoves the rubber dog dick in, and his stuffed dog animal's face in the shit. So what's the verdict on the oatmeal shit? It's not good. I really like how the poop oatmeal mix felt, but it didn't taste very good. Straight poop or poop lube is still the winner. So I guess the experiment failed. But by all accounts, Messy Tails had finally been living the life he had dreamed of since 2013. But these glory days were short-lived. Come the summer, things would change. Messy Fantasy Always being stuck in a situation where I can't stop myself from being covered in shit every moment of my life. Having a bad, greasy, fatty diet. Being completely incontinent. Not being able to realize or care when I've gotten shit on my paws. A constant ooze of shit squeezing out into my leg and underside of my tail fur, dripping off in globs, paw print shit smears marking my path. It's hard to imagine how strong your smell is when you can never stop leaking shit on everything around you. Or how much it stinks, because the shit that is sliding out from my tail hole today was the fast food and shit I ate all day yesterday. Anything that doesn't get clumsily smeared somewhere or stuck in an unreachable patch of fur will be eaten and turned into tomorrow's shit. After posting this fantasy, he would disappear for two months. It appears that at this point, somebody, perhaps family, intervened. Something he alluded to when he returned. Hee <laughs> hee, they could put me in a hospital and make me take pills, but now I'm home, and nobody can stop me from covering myself in shit. And deeper we go. I need to find a way to become psychologically irreversibly addicted to shit. If I were big and fat enough, I would eat entire used diapers. 
and he would only make two more posts after this. A few months later in November, Can't stop eating poop. Which has powerful, itchy, tasty energy. As if his addiction to shit had overcome all of his other senses. It was all he could verbalize, like a zombie that hungers for flesh. And then, on January 12th, 2018, his very last post. Things have been rough lately. I'm going to be okay, but it might take a while. I hope you're all doing well and staying messy. Touching final words. But at this time, he was still mostly flying under the radar. Although I'm sure those who did see this took this to heart and did in fact stay messy, not a lot of people were watching him, it was a small community. It wouldn't be until a year later that the legend of messy tales would spread all around the rest of the internet and enter the greater online consciousness. Going viral for his escapades several times over on every platform with people trying to get people to click on his media tab. And it was around this time that someone would emerge claiming to know what happened. Unfortunately, Brown Nose Pup, otherwise known as Eric, has died due to overconsumption of feces and lack of nutrients due to the consumption, excuse me, conspumption of feces, and died of the shock of eating feces. Is this a joke or did he legitimately die? I'm serious. Where did you hear it? We were friends in high school. He had an interest in eating shit back when we were freshmen. And this tiny series of tweets right here is why when he gets brought up, people are like, hey, didn't that guy die? But to me, this doesn't add up at all. There's a few reasons. For starters, I'm not sure that you actually can die from eating your own shit. In fact, I googled it. Can you die from eating your own shit? According to the Illinois Poison Center, eating poop is minimally toxic. However, poop naturally contains the bacteria commonly found in the intestines. While these bacteria don't harm you when they're in your intestines, they're not meant to be ingested in your mouth. And then there was another article from Gawker interviewing several professors and scientists on the topic, and it also came to the conclusion that you probably shouldn't, but it won't kill you. That being said, I'm not a doctor, so you know, don't go out and be like, hey, Wang said it was okay, so I'm gonna go eat my own shit. I'm not trying to get a call from Chubby Emu who's like, hey, do you want to act as one of your viewers who died from eating poop? Although if you need me to tell you that, I'm not sure that you can be convinced. Another thing that doesn't add up, why would his high school friend even know this? Obviously this guy went to great lengths to conceal what he was doing from the people around him. And nothing he posted would have identified him as Eric that this guy went to high school with. I even tried to look for clues through his posting history, interactions, Twitter likes. But there's nothing but fat bellies, little dicks, and shitty diapers. Oh, and this one picture of a brownie someone made. I sincerely doubt that he went around to old high school friends saying, hey, you know that I have an account on Twitter where I'm a furry and I talk about eating my own shit. Perhaps there was a shit-eating Eric out there somewhere who did die, but all signs point to this guy just making shit up. And in any case, the account is now suspended, so anything else they might have posted about it is gone. I did come across someone who might be the person behind the post, but I'm not sure and they haven't responded to me, so. The very day after this person claimed that Messy Tails died, another tweet from another account came out. Now from an account called Brown Nose Pup at Messy Tales with the L as a capital I, Messy Ties. No, I wasn't dead. I was in a mental institution. So now we have this guy that's claiming to be the original Messy Tales on a new account, not dead, still alive. He claimed that he had somehow lost access to the original account and wished he'd be able to delete it altogether. Throughout the next few weeks, he would occasionally answer a few questions about the account. He said the person with the shit-eating Eric story was a liar, and also that he had managed to completely get rid of the shit-eating fetish. Another person asked if he was interested in doing an AMA for r slash yif in hell, but he declined, adding that he would eventually tell the full story of what happened the previous year, but not yet. Some people were reasonably skeptical, but others thought it was the real deal. Some of the skepticism came from people doubting the story that he managed to lose access to the old Twitter account. The thing about that is, I've actually seen that happen to people a few times. In fact, I think that's how Leafy originally lost access to his verified Twitter. That being said, I'm still not convinced. 
There's just no evidence that this is him, and it just so happened to emerge at the same time that people's interest in the account peaked. It's the kind of thing that's ripe for some kind of attention so you can just jump in there and be like, hey, I'm the guy. That being said, without being able to access the original account, I don't necessarily know that there is a way for him to prove his identity. So it very well could be him. So right now I'm in the middle of editing this video and I just noticed a piece of evidence that I think points to the fact that the second Messy Tales is an imposter. So I noticed in this tweet from the second Messy Tales account that he spells humor with a U implying that he's British, Canadian, I think Australians also spell it that way. So I went back to the original account and I looked for words that would be spelled that way. And I found one tweet containing the word favorite spelled the American way. There's a lot of explanations for why that could be, but to me, this is a piece of evidence that says that this account is an imposter. In any case, it would have been interesting to see this person try to explain what happened to Messy Tales in 2018, as they said they would eventually do. But it appears that the account has been abandoned without this ever being addressed with one last tweet in July of 2019 asking, how's everyone going? So I think the fate of this person is something that's just going to be shrouded in mystery for the rest of time. I don't know, what do you guys think? Did he live? Did he die? Is Messy Ties really him or is that a liar? You let me know, but for now, that's all for the Messy Tales story. This video is sponsored by Brooklinen. We spend more than a third of our lives in our bedsheets, so they might as well be as comfortable as possible. Well, I'll have you know that Brooklinen makes the internet's best bedsheets. Brooklinen's classic percale sheets are made to keep you cool all night, which is perfect for people who get too hot when they sleep. And they have a 270 thread count, which is the perfect amount for this purpose. A lot of people like to go as high as possible when it comes to the thread count because it makes it softer, but the thing is it also makes it warmer. I mean, when that thread count is too high, it traps in all the heat, so you're gonna sweat your ass off. You can also save 25% by purchasing a hardcore bundle, which includes a core sheet set, extra pillowcases, and a duvet cover. You can mix and match over 20 colors. I got mine in the solid graphite color. Just click the link below to buy yourself some Brooklyn and Sheets. And be sure to use code WANG at checkout to save $20 on any order over 100. Still on the fence? Brooklyn and has over 100,000 five-star reviews. That's more than any other online betting company. Plus, they offer a 365-day warranty in case you're not absolutely happy with your purchase. So click the link below and use my code WANG to get yourself some Brooklyn and Sheets. Everything we thought we knew about Messy Tails, the brown nose pup, the furry who liked to eat the poo poo is wrong. At least what we thought about what happened to him after his mysterious disappearance. Did he live? Did he die? One account says yes, one account says no. And after my video came out, the truth about both accounts was revealed. If you have no idea what I'm talking about here, watch my video about Messy Tales first. Long story short though, there was a notorious furry on Twitter named Brown Nose Pup, Messy Tales, and he was notorious for talking about rolling around and eating his own poop, and eventually posting pictures of it. Then one day, he just vanishes. An account pops up saying that they knew him in real life, and he died. But then another account pops up claiming to be him locked out of his original account. And he's now reformed after having gone to therapy. And that's pretty much where we were at at the release of my last video. I'm very proud of my Messy Tales video. I think it's one of the very best videos I've ever released on this channel. In part just because I really enjoyed all the fun bits I put together for telling the story, but also because of how quickly its effects were felt throughout the internet, unearthing a lot of long buried truth about this story. Let's start with the simplest part. So when I was first working on the video, something I wanted to do that I just didn't manage to do was to find his full avatar. You know, you look at his profile picture and you got the face, and you see his cover photo and he's got the big fat belly, back and front. But you look at it and you just know there's more to this image. At the time, my attempts to dig it up failed. But shortly after the release of my video, I received a message from a viewer named Mauricio M on Instagram. Mauricio had also been interested in finding out what happened about Messy Tales a few months before I released my video, and in his searches he dug up some of his old accounts, in particular his Fur Affinity account, whose gallery contains a single image. The Brown Nose Reference Sheet. 6 foot 3. Share this video if Brown Nose is taller than you. 350 pounds. Likes. Mess play. Oh, you think? Even got a cute little turd-themed color guide with his shit green eyes. 
Just seeing what the lower half of Messy Tails looks like throws off my whole perception of how I imagined him. I don't know what I was expecting, maybe some like little ass scrappy do legs underneath him, hobbling under that fat belly like a tank. But now seeing that his legs are so big, he's supposed to be a dog, I don't know why his legs are so big. Now it feels like he has a tiny ass head. Never skip head day, guys. The reference sheet was created by an artist named Zephyr777, who himself seems to have been unactive for some time. Maurizio attempted to contact him, but received no response. Not that he would necessarily know anything about Messy Tales. I mean, if I drop dead suddenly, any artist that I've hired throughout the years would find out when you find out. And a very small handful of fellow travelers have come across this account themselves over the years. And they came and left their mark. Such hot wolf guy. Come on, man, he's clearly a German Shepherd. Don't miss species messy tales. Such hot wolf guy, and love good kinks, and I will love to meet you, brown nose. Gray smiley heart heart heart, I think. It's either a heart or a oven mitt. Fucking hamburger helper ass hard over here. I hope you get gunned down in the street, you fucking degenerate. You actually disgust me. You are what's wrong with this world. I genuinely hope you get dick cancer, you fucking retard. <laughs> the duality of man. These are the two wolves that are inside you. This account would also link to an F-list account. A fetish website where you list your favorite fetishes. His list is very long and includes some obvious favorites like swallowing feces and swallowing urine, and of course, anal vor, which one would assume is an act in which Messy Tail shoves you up his ass and you pilot him like a Gundam. He lists his age as 35, and considering he hasn't touched the profile in six years, he would be something around 41 years old now, if he didn't die. But that's all it can really be sussed out from these profiles. What's probably more interesting is how all the loose ends got tied up in the wake of my video. First, there's the account that claimed to have known Brown Nose in real life and that he died. In my first video, I mentioned that I suspect this person was trolling and I had an idea of who the account belonged to. At the time, I had sent that person a message and they hadn't responded, but a little after my video was published, I received an answer. And my theory was confirmed. I'm not going to reveal the person's identity, but I will share the conversation we had about this post. Hi, I have a really strange question. Were you the person who originally reported that Messy Tails died? Don't worry, I'm not going to put your name out there if you are. Yes, I actually am. My old account was suspended indefinitely, and this is my new one. And wow, Messy Tails. I haven't heard that name in a while. Nice, I actually just published the video. So. Was that story real, or were you just BSing? Oh no, when I first made that tweet, I was just BSing. I did see other comments say that he died, and I went along with it, prompting me to make that tweet. LOL, I knew it. I like how it's me saying LOL, but I still read it in the mocking voice. I think the dude actually is dead though. Which, if he is, it wouldn't surprise me, the dude liked eating poop. And this person is right, he very well could be dead. And this is further evidenced by what happened next. You see, after I published my video, the owner of the second Messy Tales account, Messy Ties, the one who had claimed to have been him and locked himself out of the account, and now he's all better and doesn't eat poop no more. Now you go to the account and you notice I'm the only person followed by this incarnation of Messy Tales. I don't know if that should feel like a badge of honor, but it does. After my video, he made a few new posts. First in Spanish, revealing that the owner of the account is from Argentina. And then he translated the posts into English. And here's what he had to say. Hey, Justin Wang. I'm sorry, this account was a fake. I made it around 2019 when I was bored with some friends and wanted to mess around for a bit. I'm from Argentina. My main account is at Helpy. I really didn't expect this account to go this far. If I knew, I wouldn't even bother making it at all. By the way, I love your videos, I'm a huge fan, heart. If anybody wants me to delete this account, I can do it with no hesitation at all, I'm sorry for causing confusion, frowny face. Of course, it would be a fan of the channel that's behind this. Kinda proud, actually. In any case, my response and a lot of other people's response was for him to not delete the account because at this point, it's a bona fide piece of internet history. You just pinned the thread so people knew what the deal with the account was. And now, as these new tweets made their way around, 
a lot of people misinterpreted it as being the original Messy Tales was fake. But, I mean, I'm pretty sure that's as real as it gets. I mean, this just goes on for years and years and years with very little attention. He was in it for the love of the game. But with both of these accounts being revealed to be fake, there's only one thing that's for certain at this point. And that is, whatever happened to Messy Tales after that point is completely unknown without a single bit of evidence in any direction. The account that said he's dead was fake, and the account that said he was alive is fake. So he's just not been heard from at all in any capacity since his final post on January 12th, 2018. And he very well could be dead, but keep in mind that towards the end of his account, he did mention people who knew him in real life trying to get medical intervention. So it's quite possible that he is still alive and has simply left this life behind. And now, Messy Tails the Brown Nose Pup just walks among us, without any of us being any the wiser. He could be sitting next to you right now, at work, school, the coffee shop, the park. You wouldn't know. The older I get, the more I forget about what it was like to be a kid. That whole period of time just kind of disappears into this fog with precious few days standing out. Pizza parties, fights, and then there was this one time. I think it was in first or second grade. I get permission from the teacher to go to the bathroom and they give you that wooden pass that every class seemed to have. I walk into the bathroom and I go up to one of those tall, full body length urinals that elementary schools always had. And that's when I made a horrifying discovery. At the bottom of that urinal, mere inches away from my shoes, was a massive turd. A man-sized turd so big that perhaps it was actually left there by a teacher. This completely blew my eight-year-old mind. I had never even considered such a possibility. No person would possibly leave a number two where number one belonged, yet there it was. Whoever that brave soul was, they created a memory that stuck with me for my entire life. They inspired me, taught me to think outside the box. I never did it myself, but I often thought about what it would be like. And years later, I found out that I wasn't alone. It was in late 2000 that a group of proto shit posters, let's call them, got together for a very auspicious conversation on IRC. A number of topics came up that night, including the idea of pooping in a urinal. They all had a good laugh, but in particular, one of them just couldn't get over. He thought about all night long, and eventually he just had to, absolutely had to register the URL urinalpoop.org. And shortly after, he would craft that website into the internet's number one destination for all things urinal poop, such as this Space Moose comic. Hmm? Tee hee hee. Space Moose, what the hell are you doing? What does it look like I'm doing? You... you can't do it in there. Oh, I'm so sorry. I must have missed it when you got your PhD in defecation. Or this comic from the Humor Archives. It's okay, I've got diarrhea. It also collected a number of short stories having to do with urinal poop. I'll regale you with this one entitled... Shitter. One night, before a girls' varsity soccer game, some friends and I drove up to the game and had a pre-party in my van before the game. It turns out we were pretty late for the game, so we quickly downed around six beers each. Before making the trek up to the field, we decided to make a piss stop in the school. The closest bathroom to the entrance we went in had two urinals and one toilet. My friend took the toilet, and I took a urinal. My other friend really needed to take a number two, but the toilet was already occupied. So, he proceeded to take a dump in the urinal. After he was done doing that, we were all laughing beyond belief. And the same friend who took a crap in the urinal started to choke on his gum because of how much we were laughing. So, he then flew over to the toilet and threw up all over the place. Needless to say, we all flew out of the bathroom at that point. The next day at soccer practice, the door was propped open to air the sucker out. That poor janitor. In addition, it also linked to a website, urinal.net, which was a gallery of unpooped urinals. In a way, this was a little bit of a precursor to urinalpoop.org, which would eventually have a gallery of its own. But at this early stage, 
They had no pictures, and the owner was asking for some submissions. Send me pictures of poop and urinals, damn it! Yes, really, I have none. If I get any, I will post them on the page. Stop sending me mail asking for poop pictures. And if you're going around pooping in urinals, it's a dangerous world out there. But don't worry, because they weren't sending you out unequipped. This fecal project mayhem gave you instructions on the best way to get poop in a urinal. How to get poop in a urinal. The easiest way is just to drop trow in the men's room and press your hiney up against the urinal and let go. However, I can think of a few reasons you might not want to take this approach. For instance, there's the whole getting caught ordeal, or having a colon prone to stage fright. Not to mention, putting your ass into close proximity with thousands of generations of urine. With that in mind, I have devised the following not-so-clever and oh-so-easy plan. In the comfort of your own home, when you feel the urge, crap into a plastic bag. Ziploc would be a good idea. Hmm, sponsored post? When the opportunity presents itself, carefully deposit your offering into the porcelain altar of liquid excrement. Congratulations! You now have poop in a urinal. Take a picture and send it here. And in the unfortunate situation that you did get caught, they had some suggestions on how to get out of trouble. The top X things to say when you've been caught pooping in the urinal. Can you get me some toilet paper? This one seems to be out. I keep slipping off these little seats. What the? Get the fuck out of my stall. I'm installing the new cakes. Didn't you hear about the guy at Starbucks who got his dick crushed in a toilet seat? Dude, I'm not gonna sit on the crapper seats. People piss all over those things. Ideally, these are supposed to be funny. And with his masterpiece finished, the creator of urinalpoop.org shared the link in a few IRC chats and walked away. In his mind, leaving it to be yet another buried treasure in the vast plains of the internet. Like the icy hot stuntas. Or Jeff Goldblum is watching you poop. But then, something unexpected happened. About a month after urinalpoop.org went live, its creator noticed a sudden surge of traffic. Out of nowhere, tens of thousands of people were looking at this website. So he went and checked his logs and noticed that all of this traffic had been coming from none other than Goatsy.cx. Yes, that Goatsy.cx. Urinalpoop.org had apparently been posted alongside the world's most famous gaping butthole. And it was shortly after that that he received his first submission for his gallery. And now here's the thing, I don't know if I would get a strike for posting the uncensored picture. There's not even anybody that I could talk to at YouTube to find out because that, that's how the system works. But I'm not going to chance it, so here's what I'm going to do. I'll be censoring the turds with the closest approximation that I can think of, and you can just be comfortable knowing that these pictures existed. Behold, the one and only entry in the very first incarnation of the urinalpoop.org gallery. But although the site's popularity was growing exponentially, it would actually lie dormant until mid-2002. According to the site's owner, it was a thread on the Something Awful forums that reminded him of just how funny it is to poop in a urinal. So he came back to his old creation and gave it a total redesign complete with a brand new logo. And thus, we entered the golden age of urinal poop. The gallery had grown, and the site now had a philosophy section which covered the three aspects of pooping in urinals. Rationale. Most of us have, at one point or another in our lives, seen a urinal. As objects, in and of themselves, they don't elicit much in the way of commentary. However, when combined with fecal matter, the urinal instantly becomes a veritable tinderbox of wonderment, derision, offense, and general unpleasantry. What would drive someone to do such a thing? Desperation? Showmanship? Desire to disrupt? General drunkenness? Indeed, the juxtaposition of these two otherwise ordinary objects is more than the sum of its parts. Thus, urinalpoop.org. Delivery. And this section was a restating of the original strategies for getting poop into a urinal, divided into two sections, brute force and covert strike. And finally, apology. Be aware that there is a darker side to urinal pooping. After the initial discovery and exclamations, thoughts inevitably turn to wondering who's going to clean it up. 
This section is dedicated to those brave and unfortunate souls upon whom the duty falls to extricate the poop from the urinal. Even for one such as myself, childishly fascinated by the phenomenon, the task is an odious one. I'm afraid I cannot offer much more than words of sympathy and an encouragement to try to look at the funny side of the situation. You'll look back on this memory and laugh. Someday. At this point, the book of urinalpoop.org had become fleshed out enough that it could practically be its own religion. However, one cannot live on urinal poop alone, and inspiration is fleeting. Although the creator of the site, regaining his motivation from somethingawful.com thread, toiled late into the night, working hard, like a Grimm's fairy tale elf making a fine pair of shoes, this would be the last time that he'd ever update it. Years went by, and at some point between late 2005 and early 2006, ownership of the URL urinalpoop.org lapsed, and it was replaced by one of those weird placeholder sites. It now proudly sported the text, urinalpoop.org. What you need, when you need it. But perhaps the time had already passed for these kinds of websites. By 2005, we were already deep into Web 2.0, and RateMyPoo.com was providing a more elegant solution for this market. But in a way, UrinalPoop.org was a site that kind of bridged the gap between the old world and the new world. I guess what I'm saying is this episode has basically been my no country for old men. Pornography is something that has historically always been enjoyed in private, away from the judging eyes of friends, family, and the general public. For the most part. And the more depraved it gets, the further we retreat into the shadows, hoping to hide our shame from the light of day. I can think of at least one glowing exception to this behavior, though. An exception in which, rather than keeping it secret, millions of people opted to share it with those closest to them, and sometimes, millions of complete strangers on the internet. This is the story of the time a filthy porn clip got turned into a communal experience for people around the world. This is the story of two girls, one cup. The other day I saw a bunch of people tweeting about a vegan milkshake made out of hummus and it suddenly reminded me of perhaps the most infamous viral shock video of all time. Of course I'm talking about Two Girls One Cup. Obviously I can't actually show this one to you here but in case you somehow missed it, Two Girls One Cup was a montage of two girls dramatically eating poop out of a cup. And after they ate it, they took turns puking it into each other's mouths, alternating roles as Mama Bird and Baby Bird. And all this goes on as a classy piano theme from a 1971 French film plays. But where did this thing come from? The Two Girls One Cup story begins when this video clip was posted to the offtopic.com forums in the After Hours section. The video quickly gained a lot of attention on these forums as it seemed to do wherever it was posted. Wanting a way to quickly share the video with friends, a user named Cajones purchased the URL 2girls1cup.com and he created the now infamous website on August 12, 2007. And he quickly forgot about it until his hosting service came knocking on his door looking for money. During the first month of the site being up, I had encountered some issues. At that time, I had no care for the site and had even forgotten that the site existed. Until one day where it was brought to my attention that I owed some money to the hosting company due to bandwidth overages. At that time, I thought it was some sort of mistake. Either that or the company was trying to get some money out of me. It was all confirmed that I did indeed exceed bandwidth usages and I directed myself to my analytics account. And if we look at the analytics screenshot that Cajones posted, it was on August 20th that the site really began to take off. It was at that point that Two Girls One Cup had begun to make its way far outside the original intended audience of OffTopic.com users and became a viral shock site in the great tradition of GoatSea.CX, Meatspin.com, or LemonParty.org. But unlike a lot of the shock sites that came before it, TwoGirls.com evolved into something that people weren't looking at by accident, but on purpose. And it was the trend of people reacting to Two Girls One Cup that really propelled it to the heights that it reached. The first such video was believed to have been uploaded to YouTube on September 21st, 2007 by a user named Fartnoot. As of the time of this recording, Fartnoot's video now has over 14 million views. 
and Fartnute's success inspired a whole wave of people to start putting their reactions out there. Practically overnight, YouTube became flooded with people sharing their reactions to Two Girls, One Cup, and their family members' reactions too. And although reaction videos had existed to some extent previously, what we are witnessing here was the true genesis of the personality-driven reaction format that would wind up taking over YouTube for years. It's kind of fitting that the reaction video genre was basically spawned by literal shit. And on October 11th, the site's traffic literally doubled overnight, going from 100,000 views to 200,000 views. And those numbers would more than double the next month. At this point, Cojones had hired a tech-savvy friend to help deal with the maintenance of the site, and additionally, he began to monetize it with ads. But the money wasn't really what excited Cojones. Rather, it was the thrill of being the man behind the shit-stained curtain. At this point, everything was Rick Ross, boss, and we felt on top of the world. Not because we were making some money off the site, but more so because of all the attraction the site had received. I felt like an undercover superstar. I would walk around Chicago and listen to people talk about Two Girls, One Cup, and I would always giggle inside knowing that it was me who created the site. It was kind of a cool feeling, but at the same time, I felt awkward for exposing something so disgusting. The fad had gone from something that was intended really just for the consumption of a specific message board to a full-blown mainstream sensation. It was at this point that celebrities started to weigh in, you had John Mayer making his parody of it. And although he was eating yogurt in it as a spoof, there were a lot of people who questioned the authenticity of the shit in the video. A lot of people thought that perhaps they had done some kind of movie magic, like what they did with Marmalade and Salo. There was a lot of debate over this, and fittingly, it was summarized really well by perhaps the only other figure in porn as mainstream as Two Girls, One Cup, Ron Jeremy. They probably substituted it for pistachio ice cream. No, I believe that's the real deal. No, I don't think that. I don't think it you is. You don't think it is? All right, keep watching. Might have substituted. Keep watching. Yeah. How could they go that much? Girls you like don't, that don't, no. don't go that much. What you think they're men? You've had girlfriends this small. You saw they go to the You think they're men? Girls have little balls when they go to the bathroom. You and this debate was actually more important than people realized. In fact, the U.S. government was quite concerned with the provenance of the shit featured in Two Girls One Cup in 2005 under the Bush administration. The Department of Justice created a new organization known as the Obscenity Prosecution Task Force. Their job was to prosecute people involved in the production and distribution of porn that they believed to be in violation of obscenity laws. And one of the men who was prosecuted by this organization was a pornographer and self-described shock artist named Ira Isaacs. When Isaacs was prosecuted, there was a lot of confusion created by news sites that falsely reported that he was the creator of Two Girls, One Cup. He was actually prosecuted for a number of different scat films, but the confusion was created when he used Two Girls, One Cup to justify his defense of Hollywood Scat Amateurs 10. His arguments would become popularly dubbed the Two Girls, One Cup defense. Until I saw Two Girls, One Cup, I wouldn't have thought so many regular people would want to watch this stuff. There are millions of people watching it. For now, it's probably most people like the shock value of it. This is art that asks questions about what's ugly, acceptable, taboo. It takes something mundane, like going to the bathroom, and puts it in a new light. It inspires people. Just because it has sex in it, and deals with a subject matter that isn't typically in art, doesn't mean it isn't art. Getting the court to decide that Isaac's films were in fact art was key to fighting off the obscenity case. But unfortunately for Ira Isaacs, the court didn't see things his way. After several years of mistrials and delays, it was found that Ira Isaacs was guilty of obscenity. And because of this, Ira Isaacs was sentenced to four years in prison. And due to the shabby reporting of a number of websites and the fact that few people actually saw their corrections, this led to a rumor that the creator of Two Girls, One Cup was actually in jail for making it. In fact, the creator of Two Girls, One Cup is very much free and has never been jailed for his work. Two Girls, One Cup was actually the trailer to a larger film entitled Hungry Bitches. This film was created in Brazil by a director named Marco Antonio Fiorito. And although the film was perfectly legal to distribute inside of Brazil, when it made it to the US, it got on the radar of Bush's task force. And it was on September 5th of 2006 when a criminal complaint was raised against a Brazilian man in Florida named Danilo Simoes Croces. 
The complaint details a several year investigation beginning in 2003 into two film distribution companies, Dragon Films and Lexus Media. It describes in detail a film entitled Toilet Man 6, as well as a number of other films all created by Marco Antonio Fiorito. To help the judge along, it also goes on to define terms like scat, bukkake, and fisting. And the complaint ends with a statement implicating Danilo. As noted above, Croce is identified as the officer, director, treasurer, president for Lexus Multimedia on filings that were submitted to the Florida Secretary of State. In addition, Croce opened and controlled the bank accounts of Lexus Multimedia and received portions of the proceeds that were made from the sale of videos and downloads by Lexus Multimedia, among other things. And at the request of Danilo's attorney, Marco Antonio Fiorito issued a statement. This statement is the only publicly known record of Fiorito addressing his work. He begins it by discussing his own history. In 1994, I became interested in producing films and on my own, I learned the art of filmmaking. In 1996, I started a business with my wife, Yoelma Brito Fiorito, who used the artistic name Leticia Miller. The business was producing fetish films. At that time, my wife and I did everything. We were the actors, the producers, as well as the filming. Sometimes we hired other people to operate the camera. We made these films to sell. When we started, the only films that we made were about feed fetishes. I placed ads in the local newspapers offering fetish films. The people that were interested called a phone number in the ad and I told them about the available fetish films. The buyers would place an order and I would personally deliver the videos to their homes, where I would collect the money for the sale of the videotapes. When the business started making money, we started to hire other actors for the films. He goes on to explain how he eventually partnered with a man named Luis Villas Boas, who was much more adept at business and helped him grow things. In 1999, I received a call from Luis Villas Boas, who had seen the newspaper ad and he was interested in knowing more about my business. Luis and I decided to meet personally. We met and I explained to Luis how my business operated. Luis suggested that the business could be on the internet. I did not understand anything about how the business could operate via the internet, so Luis explained and showed me how it would operate on the internet. I found this idea very interesting and that is when Luis and I began our partnership. The partnership was called Dragon Films. Luis helps Marco grows the business, he begins acquiring URLs, he begins hiring new staff, and that's where Danilo comes into the picture. And this is where it starts to get pretty funny because Marco did not like Danilo. I have met Danilo. I don't remember exactly when I met him for the first time, but I'm sure it was some years after I started the business with Louise. As I have mentioned before, I am a fetishist and I consider myself a person that is a compulsive fetishist, and therefore I spend a lot of money on fetishism. Louise noticed this licentious behavior. It was at this time that Louise introduced me to Danilo. Our first meeting was at my home in Sao Paulo and Danilo came with Louise. I found out that the reason Louise introduced me to Danilo was to show me that if I could control my addiction, I could be a more successful person financially. When I was introduced to Danilo Croce, I didn't like him. Since that time, I have seen Danilo a few times and always in social events, not ever in any business context. In fact, Marco's dislike for Danilo was so intense that he actually went out of his way to troll him. I always used my name in the fetish films that I produced. Letitia Miller used her name in the fetish films. Many of the actors in the fetish films use fictitious names. I decided, as a joke, to put the name Daniel Cross on a person in the fetish films. When I used the name Danny Cross, I already knew Danilo Croce, and I knew that Daniel Cross is the American way of saying Danilo Croce. So I thought it would be a joke to use the name Danny Cross, representing an influential person participating in my films. Some time later, Louise told me that he had met Danilo and that he made a comment about his name joke and that Danilo became very mad because of this. Louise also told me that Danilo requested that his name be removed from all of the films. I didn't do this because I was not worried about the repercussions of this fact and also because Danny Cross is not Danilo Croce's name. He also commented on the legality of his films. The films that I make are not illegal in Brazil and I didn't imagine they were illegal in the United States of America. I have already searched the internet, saw many American companies that sell this type of film on the internet, so I didn't imagine these films were illegal in the USA. Nobody ever told me that producing or having this type of film would be illegal in the USA. And because I don't participate in any of the administrative matters of the business, I don't know any of the contact from the American government informing us that these films or the sale of these films was considered illegal. 
If I knew that the sale of these films via the internet was illegal, I would have stopped because the money is not the main reason that I make these films. And finally, he remarked about what's perhaps the most important part. Was the poop real? I have already made fetish movies with scat slash feces using chocolate instead of feces. Many actors make scat films, but they don't agree to eat feces. Ultimately, Marco's statement did no favors for Danilo, who was sentenced to three years probation and ordered to pay $98,000. And I imagine Marco had a good laugh when he got that news. As for the Two Girls One Cup website, Cajones explains its decline. As mentioned earlier, the site was reaching its peak. The following month, December 12th to January 12th, the site brought in 8 million visits, to then follow by January, February, which brought in 5 million visits. At this point, we had been cut from all revenue sources due to the site nature and were losing money quick. We were barely breaking even for server costs and all the other good stuff. We eventually sold the site in February and washed our hands with it. The new owners did some super shady shit like require a credit card to view the video, which I was totally against for, but there wasn't anything I could have done. And although he could not legally give an exact figure, Cajones stated that it was at least six figures he was paid. And thus concludes the two girls one cup story. Look at this woman trapped upside down between two windows. You're probably wondering how she got there. Well, I'll have you know that this happened over the course of a Tinder date. She's not alone in there. She's trapped with a massive turd of her own creation. How'd she get there? Why is there poop? I'll explain in this episode of Tales from the Internet. Early on in my channel, I had a video where I was talking about one of the weirdest Tinder dates I'd ever been on. You know, the one where a girl is having a whole ass conversation with me over the sound of her own piss. But really, in general, my Tinder experiences aren't as bad as a lot of the nightmare stories that I've heard from that app. But this one right here might take the cake. Not because that anything that happened was especially terrible or bad, but because this whole situation just plays out like one strange episode of Seinfeld, and you got a Lady George Costanza. Story begins when a student of Bristol University named Liam Smith matches with a girl on Tinder. They talk for a bit and it's going well so they decide they're gonna meet up and get some dinner at Nando's. I'd never heard of Nando's before, so I looked it up, and apparently it's a chain that serves Portuguese African-style chicken, originating in South Africa and now with locations all around the world. That chicken looks mad good, although honestly it seems like it might be a bit too heavy for a first date meal. You know, in my opinion, you're gonna want to keep it light. You know, one thing leads to another, you don't want to be getting chicken sweats when you're boning. But these two threw caution to the wind and ate all the chicken. And the date's going pretty good, so they decide they're gonna go back to his place. What more can you ask for, right? You have a first Tinder date, it's going well, you have a nice meal, now you're going to take her back home. Whoa, whoa. He cracks open a bottle of wine and puts on the documentary My Scientology Movie. They're about an hour deep into Louis Thoreau doing battle with Thetans when all of a sudden, the chicken beckons. Liam's date excuses herself into the bathroom. And here's where it goes down. You've probably noticed that I've not referred to Liam's date by her name. She chose to remain anonymous in any coverage of the story. And what comes next is why she wanted to remain anonymous. She pinches off a big fat loaf of Nando's chicken shit. And it won't flush. Unfortunately, she did not have her poop scissors with her, so she had to figure something out. It's the first date, you want to make a good impression, you can't just tell your date, Oh, I took a shit that's a little too big, and now it won't go down. You don't even want your date to conceptualize you as the type of person who takes shits, let alone has struggles with them. That's at least several dates in, if ever. And uh, really, this is a tale as old as time. In fact, I came across this particular story when I was trying to find one that I had remembered from Bodybuilding.com. People seem to strangely often find themselves in a predicament where they're on a first date and have some kind of shit problem in the bathroom, often leading to some kind of cockamamie, I love Lucy-esque scheme to dispose of the evidence. So here's what she does. She notices there's a window in his bathroom, so she grabs some tissues, reaches into the toilet like James Sunderland searching for a wallet, and retrieves the poo. And a side note, while trying to remember what exactly it was that James got from that toilet, I discovered that for some reason, the Silent Hill wiki has an entire article dedicated just to toilets. But that's a story for another day. 
So anyway, the Tinder date, massive turd in hand, sets up her aim and launches it out the window. Out of sight, out of mind, right? Or was it? She washes up and leaves the bathroom. Congrats, you got away with it. But then, for whatever reason, perhaps guilt, perhaps realizing that maybe he would eventually figure out what had happened, she decides that she couldn't just let it sit there in his garden. She had to come clean. Liam recounts the conversation. I went for a poo in your toilet, she told me, and it would not flush. I don't know why I did this, but I panicked, she continued. I reached into the toilet bowl, wrapped it in tissue paper, and threw it out the window. I was understandably concerned and told her we would go outside bag up the offending poo in the garden, bin it, and pretend the whole sorry affair had never happened. So they went to the garden, bagged up the poo, threw it away, acted like it never happened, and they proceeded to have a lovely night. Oh, what's that? They did not have a lovely night? Come on, this would not be a video if it was that simple. You see, that turd never made it to the garden. Liam's window is not an ordinary window. For some reason, his window is two-ply. You see, he has a window in the bathroom that opens up at the top, but behind it, you have a one-foot gap, and behind the gap, you have another window that, for whatever reason, does not open. So what this means is, after she threw the turd over the top of the first window, it winds up slamming into the second window, rolling down and getting stuck in the gap between both of the windows. Realizing what had happened, Liam could only conceive of one possible way to free the shit from its prison. Get a hammer and smash that fucking window. So he's getting all set to acquire his tools when his date has another idea. You see, she is an amateur gymnast. She was absolutely certain that she could simply work her way through the window, reach down, grab it like Tom Cruise in Mission Impossible, float back up out of the window, thereby saving him of the trouble and expense of smashing his window. Unlike the movie though, this mission actually was impossible. But she managed to convince him it was doable and so he let her try. She works her way up over the top, but she can't quite reach it. So he gives her a little boost so she can get in further. It was exactly what she needed. She's able to reach all the way down, bag the turd, pass it up over the top to him, where he proceeds to drop it back down into the toilet where this whole problem began. And then he goes back to the window to get her out, but wait, there's a problem. She can't get out. He grabs her by the waist and pulls and pulls and pulls, but she's just stuck, upside down between two windows. After trying to figure out what to do for 15 minutes, he realizes there's only one thing he can do. He calls the fire department. They show up pretty quickly, smash her out of the window as only firemen can with their special tools, and she finally once again tastes freedom away from the oppressive fecal air. But the cost of replacing a window is a lot of money for a struggling college student. So he sets up a GoFundMe to cover the 200 pound costs. And at this point is where this goes from being just, you know, a cookie night between two people on Tinder and becoming a happening now that's spreading all over the internet. A bunch of news outlets cover it, and the GoFundMe gets enough people to contribute to it that it winds up raising £2,835 in total. And a lot of people were thrilled to be a part of this historic moment. Dope. Cool. Legend. Poo. This donation is a gift for my sisters, Louisa, Mariana, and Mia, who all love poo stories. Others weren't feeling it, though. This person is clearly an idiot. Are you so broke you need to beg for money? How about you get off your bum and get a job? In any case, with the GoFundMe far exceeding the requirements of fixing this window, they decided to contribute the rest to charity. A portion went to Toilet Twinning, which is a charity that builds and maintains toilets in the developing world, and the other part went to the Firefighters Charity. And believe it or not, they actually would see each other again after this. Although I guess it didn't quite work out in the end. The next year, some outlets would follow up with him, leading to probably my favorite headline to come out of this entire situation. Fart broken. Man whose Tinder date got stuck in window after unflushable poo reveals she's friendzoned him. After unlucky Liam Smith's horror date hit the headlines last year, he vowed to take the unfortunate girl for a second drink. In truth though, this wasn't as tragic as the headline made it sound. He noted that although it didn't quite work out, they did remain friends and stay in contact through Facebook. But listen, ladies. Oh, I'm, I'm single at the moment, but, but still looking, of course. Anyway, that's the story of the woman who got trapped inside of a window with her own poo on a Tinder date. 
Walt Disney once said that our greatest national resource is the minds of our children. I disagree. I mean, let's be real for a moment. There's a reason why we know all the stories in r slash woke kids are made up. Children, on average, are basically the dumbest kind of person. But sometimes, a child's unique brand of stupidity causes them to discover something that an adult would never in a million years think to try. Take, for example, the street children of Zambia, who supposedly developed a concoction known as Jankum. It looks like a bottle of Nesquik, but I assure you that's not Nesquik. Rather, it's a bottle of fermented sewage that the children were allegedly inhaling for hallucinogenic effects. And in 2007, after a series of posts about it online, it became the subject of a widespread moral panic as people believed that it was suddenly showing up in suburban American schools. But how much of the story was actually true? Find out on this episode of Tales from the Internet. with nutrition. Jankum is probably one of the most requested topics for me to cover on this channel. You probably saw that yellow balloon and clicked immediately, but if you don't know what Jankum is, let me explain. Essentially, what people do, and you do not, do not do this, please. They fill a jar up with pee and boo, cap it with a balloon, and leave it out in the sun to ferment for a week or so. When your balloon is inflated, your Jankum is ready to enjoy, giving you visions of God only knows what. And the thing is, there's actually a lot of confusion over whether or not Jankum is real. It's often said to entirely be a hoax, such as in this article by SoberLiving.com, which concludes with the statement, As an aside, the term jank has become quite popular with high school students lately. Kids will refer to something lame or bad as, that's janky. Wow, hip slang too? What's next? Cockroach gin? Pea brownies? Sometimes I think I'm getting too old for this crazy world. That right there is a quality vintage boomer post. For the sake of this video, to put this question to rest, I was considering making my own in the name of science, but nah, it's just not worth it. But I don't think I had to actually make it, because it seems like there's a substantial amount of evidence supporting that yeah, it is a real thing. In particular, the existence of Jankum as a street drug before any of this internet sensationalism was often covered in stories reporting on the plight of children in Africa. Outlets that mentioned it in the past were BBC, The New York Times, it made it into one UNICEF report. And the earliest known reference to it was published in 1995 by IPS, the Interpress Service. Sniffing sewage is a symptom of the desperate plight of Zambia's street children. There are thought to be some 75,000 in the country as a whole a number that has doubled in the past eight years. Nobody knows exactly where the idea for making Jankum came from, but it has been used by street children in Lusaka for at least two years. Nason Banda of the Drug Enforcement Agency is not proud when he says that it is unique to Zambia. He shudders when he sees the boys at the sewage ponds, scavenging for fecal matter to make Jankum. So without having to go and make my own bottle, I think there's enough evidence for me to say, yeah, this probably is a thing that people actually do somewhere in the world. But the real controversy comes when it supposedly made its jump to the United States of America. It begins on an internet forum named Tatsi, or the Temple of the Screaming Electron. In case you don't know about Tatsi, it began in 1989 as a dial-up bulletin board service that would be the host to a lot of controversial and unusual content. And then in 1997, it would shift to being a full-fledged internet forum. Think of it as being somewhat of a spiritual predecessor to 4chan. And with that in mind, it should be no surprise that it would be Totsi that would popularize the concept of Jankum in the United States. In particular, this takes place on June 7th of 2007 with a post by a user named Pickwick. Okay, today I set it up and put the bottle in the hot sun. My friend took pictures of all the steps. First I shit in the bottle, then pissed in it. I took a balloon and stretched it over the top to catch all of the gases. Now I'll wait a few days and hope the balloon fills up. And the next day. Hey everybody, time for an update. The bottle is on my porch at the moment. All day I let it sit in the hot sun and surprisingly, the balloon is actually inflated a little bit. It is kind of standing up and has some gas in it. The shit on the bottom has bubbles floating on it. No pictures though. My mom took the camera to my brother's prom. Thanks for your support, everyone. Tomorrow, if the balloon is big enough, then I'm going to do some jankum. Another day passes. I took some pictures of the progress. 
The shit on the bottom has seemingly turned to sludge and mixed with some piss to make a layer on the bottom. The layer is softer than just shit. I swished the bottle around and it moved. Above that one, there is a layer of dark piss that has some shit in it. There is a steady stream of tiny bubbles moving up from the shit sludge layer through this layer. The balloon on top has inflated more since last night. I put a new label on the bottle because the last one got rained on. The glass inside the bottle has a coating of water from evaporation inside the bottle. And then finally a few days later on June 13th, Pickwick would reap the fruits of his labors. Well, today I finally did it. I became probably the first person in America to huff his own shit gas. No video though, sorry, no camera. I hope you are not too disappointed. I could bet pictures though and I wrote a trip report. Today the bubbles had mostly stopped. The balloon had possibly grown a little bit since the last time, but it was oblong from days in the sun or maybe from the gases inside, so it was hard to tell. The shit in the bottle was very settled and did not look like shit anymore even. I first lightly took the bottle to make sure all of the bubbles had popped. I then pinched off the balloon and took it off the top. I held that while I huffed from the bottle. After exhaling all the air from my lungs, I took my straw and inhaled from inside of the bottle. The flavor of shit struck me. It stuck to the tongue like the flavor after smoking a cigar. My body wanted me to stop breathing it, but I kept going by putting the end of the straw further back in my mouth behind my tongue. I took some more breaths of that and I waited a few seconds, then inhaled the balloon. The balloon was less harsh. I could barely taste any of it and it felt like breathing oxygen. After breathing it in, I immediately felt that I was passing out. I did not even have time to spit before I became unconscious. When I woke up, my spittle had oozed out of my mouth and down my chin. I asked my friend how long I was out for. He said for about a minute and that he had repeatedly tried to wake me, but I would not wake up. During this short conversation, I began to feel light dissociative effects come over me, accompanied by buzzing in my ears. The feeling got stronger and stronger until I felt like I was in a dream. This was somewhat enjoyable. It made me feel like nothing really mattered. The apathy actually made the rest of the trip more enjoyable. After I was fully in the dreamlike state, visual hallucinations began to start. I had fleeting visions of people who seemed completely random, like my second grade teacher. I would say something to the person and then he or she would disappear. Normally I would be fearful of trips like this, but the dream feeling made it almost fun. Hearing was dull during the trip. I could only hear what I was saying and some random noises like screeching and car noises. After the effects wore off, my friend told me that I was mostly talking in gibberish, so I guess I couldn't hear my own voice anything in the outside world throughout the trip. At the peak of the trip, I saw things like pillars in my lawn that disappeared and shapes in the sky. My sense of time was slowed, so the whole trip felt like it was shorter than it was. The come down was mostly auditory hallucinations, like voices and loud cracks. The dreamlike feeling lessened and I drifted back into reality. In the last parts of the trip, I became paranoid from the noises because it felt real instead of like a dream. I asked my friend how long it had been. He said about 40 minutes. He also told me that I spent long periods of time staring at different spots. I also, according to him, spoke slurred works to trees and rocks. I was very surprised by how messed up the Jenkum got me. That was higher than I had ever been. Other drugs distort reality, but Jenkum really distorts reality. I was almost completely unaware of my surroundings. My friend said that seeing me was scary and he was thinking of getting an adult. Thank God he didn't do that. In conclusion, was it enjoyable? No, not really. Would I do it again? Defiantly not. Would I recommend another person to try it? I wouldn't to anyone who I am close to. If you are very adventurous and would try anything then I guess you should try Jankum. But I know that the preparation is not made worthwhile by the trip. Jane, come on. It's not good. This thread would go on to pick up a ton of steam across the entire internet, not just Totsi. And Pickwick would go on to boast about the popularity of his post, noting that it had made the front page of both Dig and Encyclopedia Dramatica. He shared the very 2007 memes people made, like the MasterCard parody and the Magic Cards. He was also excited that someone had emailed South Park Studios about his adventures and encouraged more people to write to them, hoping that it would one day get on the show. 
But Pickwick's enthusiasm would wane a few months later, when this bulletin was issued by the Collier County Sheriff's Office in Florida. On 9-1907, Corporal DeSaro received an email from a concerned parent regarding a new drug called Jankum. The parent advised their child learn about this drug through various conversations with several students at Palmetto Ridge High. Jankum originated in Africa and other third world countries, because as you all know, Africa is a country, by fermenting raw sewage to create gas which is inhaled to achieve a high. Jacob is now a popular drug in American schools. It then goes on to describe the process of making and consuming your own Jankum, which I'm sure you've heard of times in this video by now, and it also has a list of slang terms for Jankum. Winnie, shit, runners, fruit from the crack pipe, Leroy Jankums, mite, butthash, and waste. And of course, plastered all over the bulletin were Pickwick's pictures. The story would then get picked up by Fox 30's News, which also showed Pickwick's pictures. It was no longer confined to places like Totsi and Encyclopedia Dramatica. Now, Pickwick was the national face of sniffing your own shit. And once that started to happen, Pickwick rushed back to Totsi to claim that the whole thing was a hoax. He now said that the actual contents of his jar were flour, water, beer, and Nutella. He then stated, I never inhaled any poop gas and got high off of it, he wrote on September 24th. I have deleted the pictures. Hopefully no weirdo saved them to his computer. I don't want people to ever recognize me as the kid who huffed poop gas. Uh, it's a little too late for that, buddy. Me personally, I think he really did it, but I'll put up a poll so you guys can answer and give me your opinion. And despite his damage control, the legacy of Jankum would continue to spread, and he did achieve his goal of having it referenced on South Park. A few months after Jankum went viral on the internet, in 2008, South Park had an episode called Major Boobage, in which Kenny gets addicted to the hallucinogenic effects of cat pee. And all that being said, regardless of whether or not Pickwick actually did it, there is literally zero indication that this was ever a trend in American high schools. But that did not stop this moral panic from spreading to more and more districts. And the reason why that happened is actually pretty fitting. You know how I said earlier in the video that Tootsie was basically the spiritual predecessor to 4chan, right? Well, it was 4chan that took this ball and ran with it. In one particular 4chan thread, a campaign began to send this email to school faculties. I am writing you anonymously because I do not want my child to get in any trouble, but I need to alert you to something your students are doing that is potentially very dangerous. Yesterday afternoon, I came home early to find my son and his friends getting high on something called Jankum, which they say they heard about at school. This Jankum is the most disgusting thing I've ever heard of. They urinate and defecate in plastic bottles and leave them to ferment in the sun, then inhale the resulting gas. I know it sounds unreal, but when I came home, I found my son and his friends laying on the grass in the backyard, and they were acting very strangely. There was a horrible, putrid smell in the air. I can't believe my son would do something like this. I looked it up on the internet, and apparently this was something invented by African children that wound up online, and now kids all over the world are doing it. My son says most of his friends at school have tried it. This seems to be a new thing, and I can't find any information about the health effects of Jankum. I think it is the methane and ammonia content that provides the desired high, but I don't really know. Both of those are very harmful chemicals. All sorts of diseases are spread through fecal matter. I imagine it could lead to some very serious health problems at your school. My wife and I are utterly shocked and talking about private school. We have spoken to our son about this, and he says he won't do it anymore, but because it is on the internet, kids all over the country are trying Jankum, and they need to be educated about the health risks. It is only a matter of time before somebody dies from methane poisoning or this leads to a hepatitis outbreak. I don't know exactly what you could do about this as Jankum is legal, but I need to inform you of what some of your students are doing. And many of these emails that were sent out received responses from schools that indicated that they would be informing the parents about this inevitably leading to soccer moms all around the country having sit-downs with little Jimmy to tell them to not sniff their own ass shit. And all that's not to say that Jankum has never, ever had a presence in the US. There was the one time. Back in 2011, when NBC5 reported on a disaster at a Jankum lab. And police think they know why this tenant had so many containers of excrement in his apartment. Officers believe he may have been huffing Jankum. Jankum. Not even once.
Once upon a time in 12th century England, there lived a man named Roland. Roland, a court jester, was one of the most beloved subjects of King Henry II, so much so that he was given 30 acres of land and ownership of Hemingstone Manor. What made Roland so special? Well, you see, once every year on Christmas, Roland, more popularly known as Roland the Farter, would come fart for the king. <laughs> Flash forward to the year 2008. This was the year that we all became kings, when medieval pleasures were brought to our bedrooms at the push of a button. No need to wait for Christmas. This was the year when our homes became the court to perhaps the most famous fart performance in all of human history. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the story of CakeFarts.com. I'm gonna be totally honest, the intro to this video had very little to do with the actual story I'm about to cover. I just thought it was kind of funny that there is a guy who existed in the world with the name Roland the Farter. Although Roland and the star of Cake Farts do have the common ground of being professional farters, one was more for humor and one was more for pleasure. Although of course, in practice, those lines got blurred. The story of Cake Farts begins on July 17th of 2008 when a post was made on the Something Awful forums. A user named Owl of Cream Cheese wrote, You know what I liked the most? Cake Farts. Which contained the YouTube link to THE infamous Cake Farts video. I'm sure this will get taken down soon, but holy crap this is the weirdest fetish I have ever seen. I could never have imagined anyone would have the fetish of farting into cakes. Funny it stayed on YouTube so long. I would love to see Cake Farts survive in today's climate. But if you've actually never seen Cake Farts, allow me to show you what I can and describe the rest to you. It begins with a simple shot on a very plain chocolate cake, on a countertop in an unassuming suburban kitchen. A woman then appears on screen to tell us, You know what I like the most? Cake Farts. She then tastes a small bit of the cake as the camera zooms out to reveal that she's not wearing any pants. She then walks around the counter, climbs up on top of it, gets, as she describes it, comfortable, then proceeds to lower herself onto the cake. The following is the audio of the farts. For that particular fart, you can hear it was a very special fart, you could see her asshole puff out like those guys from Airman Stage on Mega Man 2. That right there, that's what the asshole looks like. And she's not done yet. Roll it. At the end of the video, it looks like she's squatting down, charging up for one last big fart, but it doesn't come. She then gets down on one knee and looks back at her asshole in a state of confusion. And that's where the video ends. Some forum users were unimpressed, while for some others it was the funniest thing they'd ever seen. But one thing was absolutely crystal clear. This video was not going to last on YouTube. Not even in 2008. It needed to be preserved, and more importantly, shared with the rest of the world. Thus, frequent Something Awful contributor Chris P.D. Peterson did what he had to do and created CakeFarts.com. Under the name The Enigmatic Cake Lord, he created the world's top destination for that specific video. And also its eventual sister site, Pudding Farts. And understand now that at this point, we're already living in a post goat sea, post two girls, one cup, post pain Olympics world. Cake Farts is far from shocking for this sort of single serving site. Cake Farts fell into kind of a new space for this kind of website, not spreading for how shocking it was, but more so just for how absurd the idea was. As just a funny fucking video, I mean she looks at her ass confused. So of course, you've seen these kinds of videos from me before, you know where this goes at this point. Millions of people are sharing the site so it gets bombarded with traffic and it becomes a struggle to maintain the website. Reaction videos sprout up on YouTube. She's kind of ugly. She looks pretty trashy. And with Cake Farts being a bit more accessible than other videos of its type, you also get some people imitating it. Perhaps most famously, Zoe Zane going on the Howard Stern show to fart on a cake for him. You can't really do that with Two Girls, One Cup or the BME Pain Olympics. I mean, you can, but who would? And while all this is going down, the creator of this website, Chris Peterson, finds himself falling further and further down the cake farts rabbit hole. In an article written in September of 2008, barely two months after the original site went up, 
he wrote an article on somethingawful.com about how the site had begun to affect his life. Chris quickly learned that the Cake for Its video was not a unique standalone piece of art, but rather a gateway into another dimension. Worlds previously unknown. Meanwhile, my inbox flooded. There were cake farting enthusiasts inviting me to their forums. There were fart porn actresses begging me to advertise their wares. Short, downloadable movies with titles like Public Fart Diaries, The Donut Shop 1, and Public Fart Diaries, The Donut Shop 2. I wanted to ask the director what vision he had about farting at the donut shop that wasn't adequately addressed in the first volume, but didn't dare. And shortly after this, he would be contacted by a man that he would come to refer as Cake Fartin' Steve. No relation to Wild Steve, at least I don't think. You see, while Chris found himself inundated with messages from old caliber of fart enthusiasts, Cake Fartin' Steve was special. Steve was the great granddaddy of Cake Fart fans. When the prehistoric fish came out of the ocean and started walking, Steve was that thing for cake farting. This message from Steve was his big reveal. If you need more content, I got it for you. A couple of years ago, I was at a forum, Queen of Farts, and I started posting scripts about women farting on cakes to see people's reaction. I was expecting to see what women would say, but to my surprise, a couple of young sexy women, Ashley, the one in your video, and Mandy started farting on cakes. I was so turned on, it was unreal, like a dream come true. I ordered that video you posted, by the way, one of my favorites. Cake Farting Steve was the man who manifested this video into existence. He had commissioned porn actress Ashley Asuka, who was around the Queen of Farts forums. Her credits included some Spice Channel appearances, Busting Bull Balls Barefoot, and Filthy Frank's Real Amateur. Not that Filthy Frank, at least I don't think so, but an even filthier Frank. And at the time Ashley and Cake Fart and Steve crossed paths, she had been actively seeking commissions. Basically, they met at the right place, right time, and Cake Farts was born. Chris had to know more. Why? What drives a man to have such a specific interest as women farting on cakes? Cake Farting Steve replied with probably the most in-depth explanation of this fetish ever written before, and that probably ever will be written. It makes me aroused thinking that a woman can not only fart in public, which is considered taboo, and not only in the sexual sense, which is considered for most people like night and day, but also farting is usually not associated with being an adult. In this context, a woman will willfully release her gas on food items, which is the ultimate taboo as bodily fluids and food are further apart as we're being educated since potty training age to abstain from mixing it up. Now to trace it back, I think it dates back to circa 1990. I was at a motel room in Florida when I came across an aging 50 plus actress sitting stark naked on a bed in Vogue Mag. She looked gorgeous. Yes, I do find some mature women really attractive. My mind started wandering and I was imagining her assistant pulling a prank on her by sneaking behind her with a cake, unbeknownst to her. She happened to need to fart, so naturally, not knowing of the presence of her assistant playing tricks on her, she lets it go all over the cake, assuming she was alone and no one would notice. Of course, she didn't know about the cake. I really didn't know what made it so erotic. Perhaps the voyeuristic and naughty nature of it, the assistant watching her naked, the prank, her being a sexy older actress, I was 18 at the time. God knows what. I was in sexual Neverland. Ever since then, I had a fixation pertaining to women breaking winds on cakes. The best part is the fantasize about smashing it in a slave's face and making him eat the fart-infested cake afterwards. Sort of a BDSM-ish twist to it, huh? I'm not a shrink, but I bet Freud would have something to say about cake farting. And the next series of messages is where Chris starts to fly a bit too close to the sun. He starts to come at Cake Fart and Steve with hypotheticals about what will and won't work. A scenario in which a woman is shopping in a cake shop and she's trying to hold in her farts but at some point she just can't hold it in anymore and engulfs the entire cake store in a big fart cloud. Midgets jumping on a woman's belly to force the farts out of her. The scene from Peter Pan where Smee farts. Being held down and forcibly farted on by a dominatrix. Steve enjoyed the store scenario but he wasn't much a fan of the dominatrix one. And at this point, Cake Farting Steve started to ask more questions about Chris, which Chris was not on board with, 
understandably so. So Chris tries to deflect by asking more questions. Do you sniff seats? Do you scratch the seats and hold it up to your nose? And what do your nostrils do when you do that? As Chris puts it, farting is the window to a man's soul, as de Tocqueville said. And I want to peer into yours and put on a diving suit and wander, flippering through your acrid dreams. But it was the last line of his email that probably sealed the deal of their relationship. Oh, and also, I hope you asphyxiate on your own farts one night with tears streaming from your irritated eyes and that your last thought is the strained revelation that you are human garbage. Damn, that's actually kind of mean, especially after Cake Fart and Steve brought so much joy into the world with that video. And judging by his response, Steve had been pushed past his limit. What the hell, man? Jesus, you sound like Freud, lol. Are you a man or a woman? I'm not that desperate. I don't sniff farts at all in public. I just fantasize about women farting on food, among other things, to get off. Tell me more about yourself. I just watched Ashley's meatball farts. Pretty sexy girl, ain't she? The only way I would tolerate your abuse is if you're a dominatrix woman. If you are, then I will smell your farts. If not, you know where to go. Common, man. I was joking. I like to smell women farts. You're pathetic. That would be the last time the enigmatic Cake Lord would hear from Cake Fart and Steve. However, a few days later, he would receive an email from the FBI issuing a DMCA takedown notice. FBI, cease and desist order immediately. Take down Cake Farts or bear the consequences. I am an undercover agent from the Federal Bureau of Investigations, Computer Crimes Unit. I was assigned to investigate whether you were violating the Digital Millennium Copyright Act 1998. I was contacted by the girl in the video who claims you had no permission to use her video in your commercial website. As a result, there is an outstanding cease and desist order against you. Whereas you had admitted to me that you are indeed the operator of www.cakefarts.com and I possess the entire transcripts of our email conversations, we actually have established your identity. Should you continue running your website in violation of DMCA Act, you will hereby be prosecuted and the host company be fined. You are warned. Now, I might be wrong about this, but I'm pretty sure this is not what the FBI does. It's probably some ambulance chasing lawyer you gotta depend on for the DMCA takedown, no? So either Cake Fart and Steve was glowing this whole time, or he's, he might be lying. Chris decided to call the FBI's bluff by responding that impersonating a federal agent is a crime punishable by up to three years in prison. And that was the last he ever heard from either Cake Farting Steve or the FBI. Although this correspondence ended on a sour note, I can't help but think Cake Fart and Steve took great joy in knowing how far his video had spread, and how many new Cake Farting videos were created due to his influence. In a way, it's as if for a period of time, we were all just living inside of Cake Fart and Steve's ass cloud. And that's the story of Cake Farts. In the fall of 2021, a man bought a Fender Stratocaster off of Reverb.com, a marketplace for new and used music gear. In this case, the Stratocaster was used. After receiving this guitar, he noticed a strange smell. But he assumed it was some kind of lemon oil, which people do sometimes apply to their fretboards. Perhaps it was just a weird scented lemon oil, maybe the lemons were bad or something. Well, after browsing one of his favorite Facebook guitar groups, he had a horrifying revelation. That smell was in fact not bad lemon oil. That smell was poop. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the story of the poop guitar. I've always been a little sketch about buying used music gear. Sometimes you buy something that's almost on its last legs, it works just good enough that it'll survive past the return policy. I've definitely had a good as new amp crap out on me live, but I hadn't even considered the following. What if you buy a piece of musical equipment and there's poop on it? It begins on October 19th of 2021 in the Guitar Addicts Facebook group, a post by David Crockett. My buddy's wife pooped all over his guitar when he asked for a divorce. It's in the rosewood fretboard and pickups and stuff. What's the best way to clean the poop off of it? 
Some early suggestions included burning the guitar inside of the home she's in with her still in it. Some people needed a little bit more info before they could help. Specifically, what kind of a dump was it? What was the texture? While well, Anil Prasad suggested there's nothing to worry about at all. Wow, this is a new one. The thing is, guitars are very spiritual. If you played enough soul into it, no shit will stick to it. There's also a little bit of amateur marriage counseling going on. Like one comment suggesting he must have done something wrong to merit having his guitar pooped on. While another user suggested that he forgives her as long as she cleans it. Something tells me he's a little bit beyond that point right now. Surprisingly though, it seems like the majority of the responses were actually trying to be helpful. With probably the best answer, you know, if you ever find yourself in this predicament, written by John Peterson. Completely strip the guitar down, neck off, electronics out, pick guard off, everything. Get a toothbrush and detail with diluted Dawn dish soap, as Doug Enderly suggested. Do a complete detail on it. It'll turn out great, and he'll be extremely happy with the result. Personally, although John's advice is pretty much the cleanest you're gonna get a guitar in this situation, if it was my guitar, no matter how clean I got it, it would just, it would always feel dirty. I've gone through this exact thing with sneakers where, you know, you step in some shit, you clean them off, you get them the cleanest they've ever been since they're brand new, but just, oh, these are my shit sneakers now. And it's even worse with a guitar, because, you know, you got your hands all over the fretboard, you're working up a sweat, you're playing live, you're, you got sweat dripping down your face. After touching my shitty fretboard, you gotta wipe my eyes, gotta wipe my nose. That guitar's done for. Never again. And I imagine that David Crockett's friend felt the same way because a month later we got an update. My buddy ended up selling the poop guitar in reverb. I hope it was a Gibson Les Poop, a Shadowcaster, and Jeff David posted an image of what it might look like, while Ronald Casey asked a very good question. Please tell us what guitar it was and hope to God none of us bought it. To which David Crockett just responds, lol. I mean, you know, what are the odds of that happening? Well, actually, I mean, it is a very active Facebook group with over 70,000 users, every single one of which might be the type of person who's shopping for used guitars on Reverb. And a few hours later, David Crockett returns. As it turns out, someone from the group did buy the guitar. And he saw the post. The following is their exchange. Hey, I think I got the poop guitar. Was it a red strat with a mint green guard? Yes, it was. Oh yeah, that's the poop guitar. His ex-wife shit all over it. What the fuck? I don't want this. I was wondering what that smell was. I thought it was bad lemon oil. But it's shit. Tell your friend to buy it back or I'm contacting Reverb. I'll shoot him a message. Have you played it? God damn it, yes, I have. Now my fingers have been all over your friend's ex-wife shit. I just texted my buddy. Fuck me. And by the next day, they had worked out a deal. My buddy and the guy who bought the poop guitar came to an agreement. The buyer kept the poop guitar and my buddy refunded half the money. I think he's gonna swap the neck out for one that doesn't smell like poop. At least that's what he told my buddy. He might try to sell the neck on Reverb or eBay, so keep an eye out for the poop neck. And sure enough, he actually did try to sell the poop neck on eBay. Stratocaster neck that has been pooped on. $2,500. Now normally, if you're buying a brand new Stratocaster neck, you look at maybe $200, $300. If you're getting the absolute top of the line that you can possibly get, maybe $700. And that's, these are, I'm talking necks with no shit on them. But at this point, the story had gained some level of infamy and went a little viral on sites off of Facebook. So maybe he thought what he had here was some important, valuable online relic worth thousands. Maybe he was just doing it for shits and giggles. But it also kinda makes me suspect a little bit that maybe the whole situation was a troll by David Crockett all along. Because surely no normal person would be that dumb. In any case, if the story is legitimate, the guy selling it on eBay probably thought he was doing the right thing by labeling it clearly as having been pooped on. But unfortunately, that's a big no-no on eBay. You can't sell poopy items. You can't sell anything containing any sort of bodily fluid. In fact, they've even been cracking down on the sweaty socks community. So, you know, the Wild West days of eBay are long behind us. Thus, the listing gets taken down and the guy's whole account is banned. And the story concludes with the buyer now demanding, since his eBay account had been deleted, that the original seller buys the poop neck back from him for $2,500. And if he doesn't do that, he's gonna sue him for selling him biohazardous materials during COVID. And then reading that, it makes me wonder if maybe the seller didn't set that ridiculously high price, thinking that by doing this, he's establishing a value that he can later sue for. 
I don't think it works like that, but you know, people come up with all kinds of cockamamie schemes when it comes to money and suing people. That being said, a commenter, Keith Schultz, has a good point. Assuming it was thoroughly cleaned and disinfected before he sold it, it's not a biohazard. As gross as our minds can imagine, shitty items get washed and reused every day, cloth diapers being one. Your so-called friend that has you to thank for spreading this shitty news. What a crappy deal, Lamau. Even though the idea of it's gross, once it's been disinfected, that's that. You can't sue somebody for making you feel yucky. And frankly, if you want to be real, you are probably touching things all day long that had poop on them. It makes me think about when I was a kid, there was this thrift store that my mother used to shop at, and I, I was afraid that the clothes she would buy would give me AIDS. To which you explain that even if there was AIDS blood on it, it gets washed, so you got nothing to worry about. But I'm going off on a tangent here. The point is, if legitimate, I don't think the buyer actually had a leg to stand on. I think taking the agreement of being reimbursed for half at the beginning would invalidate it. Because you can't just have a complaint, have someone satisfy the complaint, and then turn around and be like, no, that's actually, that's not good enough on second thought. But frankly, I still kind of have a feeling that this whole thing was a troll, so... In Star Wars Episode V, The Empire Strikes Back, released in 1980, Luke Skywalker crash lands his X-Wing in the swamps of a strange, foggy planet full of slimy green foliage and strange creatures. And it was on this planet, Dagobah, that the young Skywalker would meet his destiny, training with Master Yoda to meet his true potential as a Jedi. 32 years later on Reddit, 2012, the name Dagobah would take on a whole new meaning. But instead of a young Jedi tapping into the Force to unlock fantastic powers, a young operating room nurse tapped into a disgusting infected anus to unlock a lifetime of scars. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Swamps of Dagobah. The Swamps of Dagobah story is at this point probably the most requested story for me to cover in a video and perhaps the most infamous Reddit story that I've yet to touch. It begins on August 4th, 2012, in a thread created by Squeeples entitled Doctors slash Nurses slash Redditors, the three most qualified types of medical professionals. What has been your most gory, disgusting, or worst medical experience? The thread was inspired by Squeeples' experience as a volunteer nursing assistant, the story that made them quit the profession. They described an elderly cancer patient whose skin had turned purple all over from ruptured blood vessels. And after two days where they constantly struggled to keep his pain under control with morphine, he finally passed away. Squeeple didn't have it in him to keep seeing such scenarios play out over and over again, yet they maintained a fascination with such stories. Thus, the thread. And it garnered all kinds of horrifying responses from the medical field. A child covered in cigarette burns that his parents swore was a skin condition. A bacterial meningitis patient whose face swelled up and turned purple as he cried blood. A car crash victim whose head came off in an EMT's hands. This entire thread is filled with scenarios that go beyond the wildest depths of your imagination. But above all, there's one story from this thread that's reached legendary status and has been shared over and over again forever on Reddit. The story was told in a comment by an operating room nurse named Banzai Panda. For a long time, I've been trying to figure out the best way to present this story in a video, and frankly, every attempt to cut in some commentary or summarize it just didn't do it justice. You gotta just hear it all the way through. So with that being said, it's about a 10 minute read. Go get yourself a snack, maybe some yogurt, and just let the story wash over you. But anyway, without further ado, I present to you the Swamps of Dagobah. Oh, our nurse here. This is kind of a long one. I was taking a call one night and woke up at 2 in the morning for a general surgery call. Pretty vague, but at the time I lived in a town that had a large population of young military guys and avid meth users, so late night emergencies were common. Got to the hospital, where a few more details awaited me. Perirectal abscess. For the uninitiated, this means that somewhere in the immediate vicinity of the asshole, there was a pocket of pus that needed draining. Needless to say, our entire crew was less than thrilled. I went down to the emergency room to transport the patient, and the only thing the ER nurse said as she handed me the chart was, 
have fun with this one. Amongst healthcare professionals, vague statements like that are a bad sign. My patient was a 314 pound Native American woman who barely fit on the stretcher I was transporting her on. She was rolling frantically side to side and moaning in pain, pulling at her clothes and muttering Hail Marys. I could barely get her name out of her after a few minutes of questioning, so after I confirmed her identity and what we were working on, I figured it was best just to get her to the anesthesiologist so we could knock her out and get this circus started. She continued her theatrics the entire 10 minute ride to the OR, nearly falling off the surgical table as we were trying to put her under anesthetic. We see patients like this a lot though. Chronic drug abusers who don't handle pain well and who have used so many drugs that even increased levels of pain medication don't touch simply because of high tolerance levels. It should be noted, tonight's surgical team was not exactly wet behind the ears. I had been working in healthcare for several years already, mostly psych and medical settings. I have watched an 88 year old man tear a 1 inch diameter catheter balloon out of his penis while screaming, you'll never make me talk. I have been attacked by an HIV positive neo-Nazi, I have seen some shit. The other nurse had been in the OR as a trauma specialist for over 10 years. The anesthesiologist had done residency at a level 1 trauma center, or as we call them, knife and gun clubs. The surgeon was ex-army and averaged about 8 words and 2 facial expressions a week. None of us expected what was about to happen next. We got the lady off to sleep, put her into the stirrups, and I began washing off the rectal area. It was red and inflamed, a little bit of pus was seeping through, but it was all pretty standard. Her chart had noted she had been injecting IV drugs through her perineum, so this was obviously an infection from dirty needles or bad drugs, but overall, it didn't seem to warrant her repeated cries of, oh Jesus, kill me now. The surgeon steps up with a scalpel, sinks just the tip in, and at the exact same moment, the patient had a muscle twitch in her diaphragm, and just like that, all hell broke loose. Unbeknownst to us, the infection had actually tunneled nearly a foot into her abdomen, creating a vast cavern full of pus, rotten tissue, and fecal matter that had seeped outside of her colon. This godforsaken mixture came rocketing out of that little incision like we were recreating the funeral scene from Jane Austen's Mafia. We all wear waterproof gowns, face masks, gloves, hats, the works, all of which were as helpful as rain boots against the fire hose. The bed was in the middle of the room, an easy 7 feet from the nearest wall, but by the time we were done, I was still finding bits of rotten flesh pasted against the back wall. As the surgeon continued to advance his blade, the torrent just continued. The patient kept seizing against the ventilator, not uncommon in surgery, and with every muscle contraction she shot more of this brackish, grey-brown fluid out onto the floor until, within minutes, it was seeping into the other nurse's shoes. I was nearly 12 feet away, jaw dropped open with my surgical mask, watching the second nurse dry heaving and the surgeon on tiptoes to keep the stuff from soaking his socks any further. The smell hit them first. Oh god, I just threw up in my mask. The other nurse was out. She tore off her mask and sprinted out of the room, shoulders still heaving. Then it hit me, mouth still wide open not able to believe the volume of fluid this woman's body contained. It was like getting a great big bite of the despair and apathy that permeated this woman's life. I couldn't fucking breathe. My lungs simply refused to pull any more of that stuff in. The anesthesiologist went down next, an ex-NCAA D1 tailback, his 6 foot 2 frame shaking as he threw open the door to the OR suite in an attempt to get more air in letting me glimpse the second nurse still throwing up in the sinks outside the door. Another geyser of pus splashed across the front of the surgeon. The YouTube clip of David at the dentist keeps playing in my head. Is this real life? In all operating rooms, everywhere in the world, regardless of socialized or privatized, secular or religious, big or small, there is one thing the same. Somewhere, there is a bottle of peppermint concentrate. Everyone in the department knows where it is, 
Everyone knows what it is for, and everyone prays to their gods that they never have to use it. In times like this, we rub it on the inside of our masks to keep the outside smells at bay long enough to finish the procedure and shower off. I sprinted to our central supply, ripping open the drawer where this vial of ambrosia was kept, and was greeted by an empty fucking box. The bottle had been emptied and not replaced. Somewhere out there was a godless bastard who had used the last of the peppermint oil and not replaced a single fucking drop of it. To this day, if I figure out who it was, I'll kill them with my bare hands, but not before cramming their head up the colon of every last meth user I can find, just so we're even. I darted back into the room with the next best thing I could find, a vial of mastitol, which is an adhesive rub we use sometimes for bandaging. It's not as good as peppermint, but considering that over one third of the floor was now thoroughly coated in what could easily be mistaken for a combination of bovine afterbirth and maple syrup, we were out of options. I started rubbing as much of the mask tool as I can get on the inside of my mask, just glad to be spelling anything except whatever slimy demon spawn we just cut out of this woman. The anesthesiologist grabbed the vial next, dousing the front of his mask in it, so we could stand next to his machines long enough to make sure this woman didn't die on the table. It wasn't until later that we realized that Mastitol can give you a mild high from huffing it like this. But in retrospect, that's probably what got us through. By this time, the smell had permeated out of our OR suite and down the 40-foot hallway to the front desk, where the other nurse still sat, eyes bloodshot and watery clenching her stomach desperately. Our suite looked like the underground river of ooze from Ghostbusters 2, except dirty. Oh, so dirty. I stepped back into the OR suite, not wanting to leave the surgeon by himself in case he genuinely needed help. It was like one of those overly artistic representations of a zombie apocalypse you see on fan forums. Here's this one guy in blue surgical garb standing nearly ankle deep in lumps of dead tissue, fecal matter, and several liters of syrupy infection. He was performing surgery in the swamps of Dagobah. Except the swamps had just come out of this woman's ass and there was no Yoda. He and I didn't say a word for the next 10 minutes as he scraped the inside of the abscess until all the dead tissue was out. The front of his gown was a gruesome mixture of brown and red. His eyes squinted against the stinging vapors originating directly in front of him. I finished my required paperwork as quickly as I could, helping him stuff the recently vacated opening full of gauze, taped this woman's buttocks closed, and hauled the dressing for as long as possible, woke her up, and immediately shipped off to the recovery ward. Until then, I'd only heard of alcohol showers. It turns out, 70% isopropyl alcohol is about the only thing that can even touch a scent like that once it's soaked into your skin. It takes four or five bottles to really get clean, but it's worth it. It's probably the only scenario I can honestly endorse drinking a little of it too. As we left the locker room, the surgeon and I looked at each other, and he said the only negative sentence I heard him utter in two and a half years of working together. That was bad. The next morning, the entire department, a fairly large floor within the hospital, still smelled. The housekeepers told me later that it took them nearly an hour to suction up all the fluid and debris left behind. The OR suite itself was closed off and quarantined for two more days, just to let the smell finally clear out. I laugh now when I hear new recruits to healthcare talk about the worst thing they've seen. You ain't seen shit, kid. TLDR. Don't shoot IV drugs into your taint. That deserves an upvote, and you deserve a freaking medal of honor. Is it weird that your story makes me want to be a doctor even more? It kind of is. Clearly, after reading the story, the majority of Redditors were floored by it, not just for what it contained, but for how it was told. So the next thing Reddit does, of course, is ask for shitty watercolor to paint it. Shitty watercolor responds with an IOU. Regrettably, Mr. Shitty is currently unable to paint rectal explosions as he is painting a series of watercolors to mark the final descent of curiosity. Yours sincerely, Mr. Shitty. 
You see, while all of Reddit was enthralled by this tale of an infected exploding asshole, the Mars rover Curiosity was making its final descent back to Earth. How fucking serendipitous is it that this video that starts with a, a Star Wars reference somehow manages to circle back to actual real-life space travel? In any case, shitty watercolor would make good on this drawing two years later, receiving Bonsai Panda's seal of approval. Speaking of Bonsai Panda's Star Wars reference, Redditors also took this opportunity to try and come up with a name for this story. They recognized that this one would also be remembered among stories like the Jolly Rancher story, so they had to come up with a name for it where you just say it then you know what it is automatically. And actually of all the suggestions, Swamps of Dagobah wasn't one of them. The closest being the Dagobah story. But some honorable mentions include Maple Syrup River, The Asplosion, and Zombie Butt Geyser. But throughout the rest of the thread, without anybody saying that this is what we were gonna call the story, people just seem to latch on to that one phrase, Swamps of Dagobah, because really it's just such a solid pull for what this is. They recognize that you could just say Swamps of Dagobah, and anyone who's familiar with the story knows you're not talking about Star Wars. And of course, with any story like this on Reddit, you had those who doubted its authenticity. And while obviously you couldn't verify something like this without a gross violation of privacy, but other medical professionals in the thread seemed to co-sign the idea that, oh yeah, this is a thing that happens. So what happened to the patient after? As far as Bonsai Panda knows, she survived. And not only that, the Swamps of Dagobah lady dipped without paying, or as Bonsai Panda put it, she dined and dashed. And I'm sure there's British people watching this that are like, yeah, and? So Bonsai Panda explains further. Healthcare financing is tricky, much in the way that Shilab's lair is tricky. This particular individual was covered by Indian Health Services, which covers Native Americans. So normally we send the bill to them. But IHS requires registration, and she had it registered. And because you can't squeeze blood from a turnip, it doesn't matter how many delinquent notices you send someone, if they don't pay, and they don't have any money in the first place, there's not a lot you can do to them. So that lady got to spray her ass ectoplasm all over the hospital, mark her territory for who knows how long, and not even pay a dime. Sounds like a win to me. Seeing how much interest there was in this story, later that day, Bonsai Panda would do an AMA. In the initial post, Bonsai Panda gives more specific details about his work. I specialize in spine and orthopedics, trauma and general surgeries, but have experience in pretty much every specialty. I've carried breasts in a Ziploc bag, seen a broken penis, it's a real thing, sawed off legs while the patient was awake, seen pus rocket out of rectums, plus lots of other cool stuff. He also stated that he wouldn't give away any information like locations that would compromise past patients or co-workers. He also said he wouldn't diagnose people in the comments, although there was at least one person who was not deterred by that warning. He also had to clarify that he is in fact a male nurse, because everyone seemed to assume he was a woman because he's a nurse. So in a lot of the thread we got some insight about Bonsai Panda's background. At some point, he considered teaching before ultimately going into nursing as both of his parents had, and ultimately starting off working at the same hospital that they did. He hadn't gone to med school because he thought at first that it would be above his head, but after actually getting into the field, he began to reconsider it. Although he did have some concerns about knowing just how much depth you go into in med school. But of course, what most people wanted from this thread was just more crazy stories. And they absolutely did get a lot of crazy stories from Bonsai Panda. When asked about what his most nerve-wracking operating room experience was, he spoke of a young cliff diver who had burst two vertebrae and was hypothermic from the cold water. At the same time, the temporary surgeon that was brought in for this procedure was furious that the room was too warm to operate in. With the patient still awake and listening to everything, he began to yell at the rest of the staff until they got things in order. Ultimately, that surgeon was reported and banned from the hospital. Another incident he described was of a man with gangrene of the butt and testicles. A situation where his flesh was so rotten that one of his testicles was just kind of just out hanging loose. The strangest thing he's ever taken out of somebody? There's a few. Carrots stuck all the way in the bladder. Not just once, but twice. A man and a woman. I guess that's a more popular sounding implement than I realized. A needle stuck in a roll of fat and a dildo stuck so far up someone's ass that they had to cut them open and as he put it, milk it out by hand. 
and apparently the staff all took bets on what color it was going to be. And when asked about what the saddest case he ever dealt with was, he told the story of a church camp bus that was full of kids and flipped onto its side. Several of the kids got their limbs caught under the windows. He worked on two sisters, one of which had her leg bone exposed. Some of the nurses, who themselves had kids, couldn't stop crying and just had to leave the room. But he stood by as the plastic surgeon stripped the dead tissue to prevent infection. Fortunately, the girls did survive, and in a post about their follow-ups, he laments one of the strange downsides of being in this field. One was a little worse off than the other, and she came back for several skin grafts, but both of them went home to their families within a few days. I was lucky enough to be in on her subsequent procedures. One of the unforeseen downsides to being in the OR is that we never get to see the outcome of our work. We do our part, and then the patient is gone. We never know the ending. It was pretty special to get to see her slowly heal and eventually leave us. Bonsai Panda shared a lot of stories in this thread, and I'm not going to read all of them, so I definitely recommend if you're interested going and checking out the original thread. Bonsai Panda also took the opportunity to reflect on how working in this field can affect someone's mindset. In particular, one user asked if seeing all these crazy scenarios play out in front of them has made him more cautious in his own life. And he mentioned that in some ways it had the opposite effect, showing how resilient the human body can be. In particular, after being diagnosed with bone cancer, thankfully non-fatal, he decided to take up powerlifting, an interest that his posting history reveals that he has kept up with throughout the years. At this point, it's been about eight years since Banzai Panda's story, Swamps of Dagobah, has become a thing of legend. But much more recently, Vice had the chance to catch up with Banzai Panda, whose name they identified as Kelly, and who they referred to as she, which I guess the name Kelly didn't help in that situation, to reflect on this old story. He mentions that although he didn't necessarily realize it at the time, it actually wound up being very therapeutic for him to share these stories in this way. And with this story becoming such a famous tale, he shared a little anecdote about it bleeding into his real life. My internet fame has had the same effects on my life as pretty much everyone else's. Not at all. Probably the closest thing to an IRL effect, was when I was working at a university hospital in Seattle and overheard two new surgical residents discussing my Reddit story and trying to decide if it was real or not. Neither of them having any idea that the author was standing in the room behind them. That was the first time I realized just how many people were actually on Reddit and how far the story had spread. But anyway, that's the story of Swamps of Dagobah. If I had a choice in the matter, I would only ever take the biggest shits possible. I mean, it just fucking feels good. You know, you feel like you're fucking born again. It just completely replenishes your HP. You become like Piccolo after he takes off his weighted clothes and he can finally fight at his full power. However, with big shits comes big responsibility. Submitted for the approval of the Midnight Society, I call this story... The Tale of the Poop Scissors. So three years ago, there was a thread on Reddit that asked, If a crime happened at your home, what would be the most embarrassing thing that the cops would find while investigating? A user by the name JoeBloof69 responds, My poop scissors. No clarification needed. And oh boy, is there fucking clarification needed. Are you fucking kidding me? He says that poop scissors. Like, we all say, yeah, I just got poop scissors laying around. But luckily, he took it upon himself to explain. Alright, I'm drunk, so I'll get it out there. As we all know, the beer shits are the best shits. When I was younger, I only took shits like three times a week, instead of every day like a normal kid. I also ate a shit- <laughs> I also ate a shit ton, so these tri-weekly shits would more often than not be generously proportioned. I clogged our toilets so much and my parents would get pissed. Problem was, these monster shits weren't going anywhere. So I had to get creative. Enter the poop scissors. A nice, strong, sturdy pair of scissors from the junk drawer. If I took a shit that I felt was just too big, no problem. I'd use my poop scissors to chop it up into pieces. <laughs> it's making it flushable. As you may imagine, they got used quite often and poop got caked onto them real fast. So, wait, why don't you fucking wash them then? Holy shit. Like, it's... Even if the poop is, like, staying stuck to it, you just put in a little fucking elbow grease and, like, get it off of there. Why... Why would you do that and just fucking not clean it properly? 
I quickly realized that these scissors could never be used for normal use ever again. So each time I was finished with them, I wrapped them up in a handkerchief and hid them in a closet. That seems like a recurring theme with these people who have these terrible fucking secrets that they just hide their shame close to their family in the closet. Like the fucking Telltale Heart, it's, except it's like the fucking the Telltale Poop Scissors. Haven't used them in like eight years or so, but they're still in there. Oh my god, they're like a fucking like a... Uh, an ancient fucking artifact now, they're gonna turn up in fucking Olmec's temple. I live away from home for most of the year due to school work. Wait, so he like, he left this fucking albatross, this fucking disgusting pair of scissors that he used to cut his shit up into pieces. He just left it with his, his fucking parents. Like, you have to wonder, like, if after he moved out, if his parents just went, so, like, to clean up the closet where the hell they found this pair of scissors with shit caked on them. Like, what? And unfortunately, this guy never came around and, uh, got the picture of his poop scissors. He actually fucking disappeared for a bit. So, you know, these things, they're gone to the fucking ages. In 2016, the 31st Summer Olympic Games were held in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. Perhaps one of the most storied Olympic events ever. Not so much for the competition, the sportsmanship, or the athleticism, because, you know, who really cares about any of that? It was storied because of what an absolute disaster this event was. An event often referred to as the Apocalympics. But of all the disasters tied to this event, perhaps the most elusive is one that would often come up on 4chan's paranormal board, X. The Brazilian Spongebob Incident. The supposed Brazilian Spongebob Incident involved a broadcast intrusion that caused several people to poop their pants. So for today's episode of Tales from the Internet, let's take a look at what might be Brazil's equivalent to the Max Headroom Incident. Despite allegedly occurring in 2016, the earliest reference I could find to the Brazilian Spongebob incident was in 2018. A thread on X, Lost Media Thread. Top 10 Lost Media, who are they? You have a lot of familiar items pop up in there like the Junko Furuta tapes, or Saki Sanobashi. But there are also quite a few less commonly known ones, including some that I was not familiar with at all. But it's one post in particular that sends a lot of people in the thread for a loop. A bunch of missing 9-11 footage that was seen and not seen before, the confiscated photos and films from Japanese filmmakers during Hiroshima and Nagasaki that are stored in an archive, a lot of Doctor Who episodes, the Brazilian Spongebob incident that made people poop themselves to the point of needing hospitalization allegedly right before the Olympics. And they were so fascinated by it that another thread about just this was made the next day. And a few different people on both threads seemed somewhat familiar with the tale, although with similar but slightly different tellings. But here's the gist of what allegedly happened. Right before the Olympics broadcast in Brazil began, an episode of SpongeBob SquarePants starts to play. Some say that this was a broadcast error, like you know, the time in 2007 that Comcast accidentally played hardcore porn on the Disney Channel. How embarrassing! Others say that this was a deliberate broadcast intrusion along the likes of the Max Headroom incident. And nobody seems to recall what episode exactly it was, although some have brought up Squidward's suicide. Which is a, a supposed lost episode that, you know, was just a part of some bullshit creepypasta. Others claim that it was a bootleg Spongebob-like show, which was actually something pretty common in Brazil. Brazil being the home of such classics as The Little Panda Fighter, The Little Cars in the Great Race, and of course, who could forget, Ratatouille. But the episode that played isn't actually that important. What's actually important is that during this broadcast, what allegedly played was the brown note. Not to be confused with the similarly titled Casey Strain song. I'm talking about the supposed audio frequency between 5 hertz and 9 hertz that can't be heard, but it can be felt. And when you feel it, it makes you shit your pants. <laughs> Thus, you have everyone in Brazil at home getting ready to watch the Rio Olympics. All of a sudden, SpongeBob comes on and they all shit their pants. But despite so many people in Brazil shitting their pants at once, almost none of the many Brazilian users of 4chan seem to remember this happening. Why could that be? 
you were too busy shitting your pants. Others claim there was a concerted effort by the Brazilian media or government to cover up this story. I am Brazilian and can confirm. This were all over the news in Rio. I remember seeing news reports with Olympics representatives doing some major damage control. No clips of the episode shown though. But there are a few problems with this story. For starters, pretty much no TV is actually capable of producing this frequency. It's rare that a TV can produce anything lower than even 60 Hz. Now if you have a home theater system with very expensive audio equipment, you can get a bit lower, but generally not that low. Why would they? It's just not necessary, because you can't hear it. Furthermore, even if they could generate this frequency, the consensus seems to be that the brown note is a myth. Throughout the years, many people, such as the Mythbusters, have attempted to make themselves shit their pants with this note. They tried out these low frequencies and failed. For the Mythbusters, there were other effects like feelings of nausea, anxiety, shortness of breath, but no poop. The same goes for experiments conducted by NASA. These ones didn't involve just listening to the frequency, it involved very low frequencies being sent directly to the body with vibrations. These subjects had similar complaints, nausea, anxiety, shortness of breath, but once again, no poop. It's commonly believed that the myth of the brown note originates from a satirical article in the December 1974 issue of New Science. The article describes the creation of an amplification device known as the Colossophone. During the official inauguration of the device, Prince Albert amplifies the national anthem through the horn, causing the entire audience to shit themselves. Something that the prince believed to be a protest at the time. Although the article was, as I said, satirical, a lot of people just wound up believing it and thus you have the myth of the brown note entering the popular consciousness. All that being said, I don't think that the idea of the Brazilian Spongebob incident just simply manifested itself out of nowhere in 2018. Although it's possible that that ex-poster just made it up on the spot, I think it's more likely that this rumor was circulating around the time it was claimed to have happened. I had actually forgotten all about this until working on this video, which is pretty funny since I actually made a video on this topic back in the day. Think about the 2016 Olympics. They were such a massive disaster that they would often be called the Apocalympics. Just because of the sheer massive logistical and environmental and humanitarian disasters that occurred during it. You had things like living quarters with unfinished sinks that are holes that just go down to the lower floors, reporters getting mugged, Olympians' rooms getting robbed, fake recycling bins that empty out into the regular garbage, the Olympic diving pool being closed because the entire building smelled like farts, the airport getting flooded with shit water, hotels getting flooded with shit water, the water for the rowing event being flooded with shit, competitors shitting themselves. I think you get the gist. So with all the legitimate stories of what a disaster these Olympics were, many of the stories involving shit, it stands to reason that a few fake ones, whether it be as a joke or as a troll, materialize and work their way into the public consciousness. So no, the Brazilian Spongebob incident was most likely not real, but it makes sense why people might have thought it was. Oh, another shit thing happened at the Rio Olympics? Sure, why not? But anyway, that's all for now. If you like this video, check out my video about the Max Headroom incident. I'm out.